once you go into grizzly country, you are automatically entering a system where man is not the dominant animal. You don't have the option of blowing the bear away, and therefore you have to deal with the bear. If we want to have that great bear out there, I think we have to accept him just as he is, with all his cantankerousness, with that indomitable quality about him. This is grizzly bear country in late summer, a high windswept mountain meadow in Glacier National Park. It's also about as far away as you can get from Vietnam and that war of 20 years ago. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature, and ironically, there is a connection between this place and the war because a Vietnam veteran named Douglas Peacock has devoted most of his life since the war to saving the dwindling population of grizzlies, one of the world's largest carnivores. After being traumatized by the Vietnam War, Peacock found a measure of peace in his private war to save the great grizzly's habitat, out here in our magnificent Northwest. This is a very special film for me personally. I can identify with Doug Peacock because I spent a year in Vietnam at the height of the war, not as a soldier like him, but as a reporter. And there is much I saw I just as soon forget. So I like being here in what's left of our great wilderness, just knowing there are grizzlies far away from Vietnam. <laughs> I came back in 1968 after the Tet Offensive, but I got to a lot of places in Vietnam before the war did, and it wasn't a terrible place. I, I loved the people, I loved the country, it was wonderful. I mean, there were tigers there, there were deer there. I was a medic and was under the illusion, at least, that I was doing some good along the way. But after the Tet Offensive, it was altogether too much. I was a real basket case when I got out of there. I started filming grizzlies in 1975 full time. That meant I had to I had to move to either Glacier or Yellowstone National Parks essentially because those are the only places that had any bears left. I came up here late in September from the North Cascades and uh, I walked up to the Apgar Mountains and I stood on the top of the, the highest peak there. I just counted 14 grizzly bears and I looked off in the distance and there on the top of a mountain was a fire lookout. So the next year I put in one application for one job in the whole world and it happened to be Huckleberry Lookout and they were stupid enough to give it to me.
I'm not out to take the greatest chances that I can take. I'm simply out to finish this project with the Grizzly. It's, it's a great hunk of my life, and I'm close to wrapping it up in some way. But that involves an element of risk. My dreams are filled with dangerous encounters with bears. Sometimes the bears are, are ferocious and even a, a little unnatural. It's curious, but it's also very practical. I work out all my fears and my dreams, and then when I get out there in the, in the real world, I've, uh, I don't have to bother with them much. A couple times a week, sometimes, I'll dream of bears. among the Plains Indians was always something more than a bear, a symbol more than anything else, of courage and power, a sort of awesome being who was sent down on earth to humble men, to make men humble. I have a relationship with this one bear very drawn to the bear. He's my most important grizzly bear, but he's also the most dangerous animal I know. And uh, he's the one that keeps destroying my gear. He's the one that ate my t-shirt, for example. He's the one that ate my sleeping bag. He's the one that essentially chewed to pieces everything that smelled of me while ignoring lots of other things. And the, the quintessence of the grizzly year for me comes when I go out and I see this one animal. Some years I don't film him, sometimes I, but I, I make sure he's there. If I ever get mauled or seriously hurt or killed by a grizzly, it'll probably be by him. And yet, uh, the high point of my year comes when I find him. incredibly hypocritical for me to uh, go out and pretend that I'm making a, a film that's going to benefit and help grizzlies and invade the last territory, the last few bears we've got left here, and also carry a big piece just so if things don't go just so-so. It's not my turf. Uh, blow them away with a 44 Magnum. I, I don't think that'd be, uh, that'd be poor manners. You don't have the option of blowing the bear away, and therefore you have to deal with the bear. And that teaches you a lot. You learn a lot about bears. You learn a lot about yourself by having to stare down grizzlies. thought I was too active to take a job as a fire lookout, but it turns out it was, it was a perfect job. It's just contemplative enough to suit my needs. I get a lot of reading and writing done. You get to look down on the backs of bears and eagles. And if you like your own company, it's like getting thrown into the briar patch, you know? You're surrounded by grizzly bears. In past years, they had a lot of trouble. They had a lot of trouble with people that uh, didn't like bears applying for jobs as fire lookouts, and the lookouts would often quit and leave because they're afraid of bears. Go back to Chicago. Mostly it was the quiet. Once the radio got turned off, there was nothing making a sound for 20 miles in any one direction. 
And at night, she could see no lights. She could see the lights of Kalispell and Columbia Falls, maybe 30 miles away. But you'd look out, and one side of the lookout was dark as far as the eye could see. And all that space is really the stronghold of wilderness that's left in the lower 48. It's the stronghold of the last grizzlies, anyway. And all that, that darkness, uh, that meant a lot to me. Just having that blank spot on the map, an absolute void of any human activity whatsoever. Uh, this way, I got my pickup. It wouldn't start. Sorry, I was late. It often doesn't. Open these doors one at a time. My windshield wiper. That's okay. Go ahead and get out. My windshield wiper. Hi, hon. Hi. This is Dane Williams from New York. Hi. She's interested in writing about grizzly bears. <laughs> and I'm going to take her up the mountain someplace. Who's this? This is Laurel. And this is Laurel Louise. What are you Louise. doing, Jane? So this is home, eh? Yep. It's quite a snug uh, home. <laughs> Come on in. Okay. I bought a dead drunk in a bar in Tucson for 400 bucks. And you're still living in it, right? Li here, this is where I ran into an irrigation ditch out of Santa Fe one night. Were you drunk then, too? No. Yeah. No. Lisa was up at the Grizzly Hilton when she was eight and a half months pregnant. And I <laughs> thought she was seven and a half months pregnant. I mean, we, I almost blew it all together. We, we were going to have Laurel with a midwife and a little birthing room. We never yeah. made it. We had her on the road. We <laughs> left, you know, we went out of here, and one day later, bounce, 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 here comes... Uh, I'm, I'm reading the books. I'm, already, I'm, I'm on Up at the Grizzly Hilton? Six. No, no. No, we got down from the Grizzly Hilton, but bouncing on the road from here to Great Falls brought on labor. And I'm still on month six, you know, trying to figure out what's going on there. <laughs> it, uh, we, we invented some last-minute breathing exercises, and they seemed to work, and that's what we got. Yeah. When was she born? On the 7th of October, oh, my favorite time of year. Libra. Is that what she is? Uh, I think uh, so. As long as she doesn't have my horoscope, I don't care. Well, what is your horoscope? You it's all like, bad. You've Apparently, your horoscope several it, times. it's something one would prefer not to have, as far as I can tell. What is it? Well, I had this woman worked it out for me once, and she came to tell another woman who was a friend of mine about my horoscope, and she broke down in tears and was sobbed, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I <laughs> never found out the particulars, but it's, like I say, it's something one would prefer not to have, I think. When was the first time you ever saw a grizzly close up? Well, it was in Alaska, and I was a punk kid packing a 44 Magnum on my hip, and we were hiking across some sort of open country, and all of a sudden, at about 100 yards away, a grizzly sees us, stands up, and immediately just charges. Doesn't hesitate, nothing. I take my 44 Mag out, and I've got them all ready to go, and I've been reading all these horror stories about grizz and yeah. all these macho books and talked to all kinds of hunters, and I knew after about two seconds I wasn't going to shoot the bear anyway, you know? Did the bear keep coming? The bear kept coming up to about 15 feet of away then it sort of lifted up its front paws not really a rear but sort of lifted up caught our scent and veered and ran away just as fast uh -huh. after that i quit carrying guns in grizz country well what would you do if a bear charged you you got to stand your ground because there's nothing else you can do up there there's no trees to climb and oh, there bear, aren't no and bears do this to each other all the time most charges are bluffs of course you never know until in, until it happens but uh, you, if you stand your ground the odds are the bear will stop and veer, turn you think off. That, that people are, that are killed by bears, uh, that happens because they try to run away? Or they try well, to... that's where a lot of people get hurt, because they, 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 they move too quick when they should be standing their ground and they trigger the predator instinct, because grizzlies are predators part of the years, and part of that instinct is there. So if, if you get charged by sawwood cubs, and she's only 40 feet away, and you make a move for a tree, she's likely to conclude that charge. But if you, if you stand there and just stand your ground like another dominant bear, 99 times out of 100, she won't. Should you have your arms out? I guess I do, because I think it makes you look a little larger, that's all. Uh-huh. <laughs> what is this supposed to, is this supposed to help, or what? Yeah, this, this just, I think this helps. Smoke is a natural uh, 
is, is a natural scent, and and they just don't pick up on other smells as much if you if you smoke your clothes. I think uh -huh. it sort of I think it sort of hides or camouflages your human scent, uh -huh. which is uh, the main thing bears key off of. They key off movement. Their hearing is a lot better than ours, but their nose is just unparalleled in the animal kingdom. They can smell a human being a mile away. <laughs> That's true. Well, what uh, what happens if we're up there sleeping and a bear comes along? We got to hear the bear coming, and we got to hear the bear coming. Yeah, he makes a lot of noise too, and and. It's, and then you it's, climb a tree. No, I usually make a little noise and talk to him, and he, and it keeps him at bay. But he he's a dominant bear, and he never runs away very far. So all we can do is we if we hear something out there in the brush, I'll wake up and I'll get up and I'll walk around and I'll talk to this animal, try to keep a fire going most of the night. It's it's not a time of year when you can get much sleep up there. It's, uh... Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to stay up there tonight. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> Neither do I. Well, I hope you're willing to stand my ground for Grizzly. We'll be okay. <laughs> Honest. It's just going to be a, a sort of tense night. Maybe a, a sleepless night, that's all. We'll make up for it later. And I think it could be beautiful tomorrow if it snows. It's better to have snow than rain. Rain is miserable up there. There's nothing. Large fir tree over there, the very largest one. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now look right over the top of it. Just over the top of it, about 10 feet. You'll see. There's three bears. Two of them are kind of blocked. I see it. Okay, got them. Those are grizzlies. There's two yearlings that are sort of bandit colored, and the mother is quite brown. I don't see the mother. Okay, she's brown. Just, just keep looking in the area. There, there's yes, now I can see them right there. seen his two so far. The two yearlings are out to the right and the mother's to the left. I'm still around. I wasn't sure there'd be any left.
Look at the two cubs going each other. sees him, he's likely to charge. Yes, he will try to kill him. There's the cops. Did you see that? On the side of the lake. Two yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a really tense time of year. It looks like it's going to snow tonight. Oops. There he's going down to the water. Yeah. The wind is rising means that front is coming in.
No, I think that's another sound. I don't think he'll be back tonight. He was, he was on his way out and he just comes through here just to bother the bears. But it's, there's, for me, there's hardly a greater evil than a helicopter. It all goes back every time I see one. I have that same feeling when they were machine gunning me in Vietnam. What helicopter was doing that? It was one of our helicopters there. They one, of, one of our helicopters? Sure, they shoot at anything up there. They were just shooting because you were moving? Yeah, because there's something to shoot at. They don't, uh, those boys up there don't care. Throw their tumbling dum dums at all kinds of things. Mountain yard babies, water buffalo, green beret medics, all the same. And I get that feeling anytime I see a helicopter. The one place I hate most of all to see a helicopter is in wilderness, mm -hmm. in a wild place like this. And if I were armed, I'd probably shoot at the son of a bitch. I'd probably pr probably try to shoot him down. It's something I almost... It's almost a, an automatic reaction to the sound of the blade. It's, it's visceral. Look at me. I'm shaking right now. I was in the hospital in Da Nang during the Tet Offensive. I'd extended my tour twice. They should have gotten me out of out of country about two months before I actually left. By the time I got back out to the countryside, the Tet Offensive started to catch up with the countryside. They came back from the cities and they hit the outlying areas. I watched everything that, that I'd really really tried to do, which is build dispensaries and hospitals rebuilt a couple of villages, everything was burnt to the ground, everything was level. Unfortunately, a sergeant got a hold of the radio when I wasn't around to stop him, called in airstrikes on the VC who were hurting villagers across the river and they killed a couple hundred civilians. They were, you know, they're all women, children, and old men. So I sat there and, and pieced together bodies for four days and after four days, I didn't have anything left. Just craziness. I was out of the country within 48 hours. picked me up at this little airport in the middle of all these cornfields and uh, started to drive me back home and the first thing I remember is I hadn't gone that fast in two years. She was driving probably 50 miles an hour and I was terrified. I was holding onto the dashboard. I made her drive 30 miles an hour all the way home. That was my first recollection. I guess I didn't have much to say to anybody. I couldn't really talk to anybody. Do you remember your first conversation with your father after you got back? I just gave him a hug. We didn't I, I couldn't say anything. I was a wreck. He was just really overpowered to see me uh -huh. home. <laughs> I, I went a couple of years without a serious conversation with anybody in, in, in a way. If it wasn't life or death anymore, it no longer concerned me. Uh, the real marginal part of the human race right then. That's when I first started hanging out with grizzly bears in Yellowstone. So the therapy, the therapy that worked for you was to be in the mountains to go back out and crawl back into the brush. It's just something that works for me. It, mm -hmm. it helps if I have other things around, like grizzly bears, that force you to take uh, a less myopic view of yourself. You can't, you can't take yourself too seriously being confronted with big bears. Self-indulgence is just totally impossible in grizzly country.
beat. He's a short. He's a big, he's a stocky bear. He's a funny looking bear. And he's very dark. You can see it now when his skin gets wet. He's especially dark. But he's my Moby Dick Grizzly. He's the one that I come to see every year. As soon as I see him, I usually leave. Why is this bear special to you? I mean, why is this the Moby Dick bear? I backed him off a ridge one time and he let me by. He didn't have to do that. But then he came back and served notice on me by eating my t-shirt and sleeping bag. So he's obviously got a relationship with me. He doesn't especially want me around, but he tolerates me part of the time. It's just a little better when he's around. Life's a little better? Yeah, it is. He makes my life a lot more insecure, but much more interesting. <laughs> that bear might come up and, and nose around, and I don't know what he'd do. You're afraid he'll come up tonight? If he knows we're here, he might. He did one time. You said that you backed that bear off a ridge, and that was the night that the bear... The bear al allowed me to pass. The bear allowed you to pass. Mm -hmm. But then that night was the night... All night long, I got back up to the top. I knew I was going to see that bear again, so I built a little tiny fire right on the top. Within 20 minutes, I could hear crunch, 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 crunch. Here comes this big bear. Mm -hmm. I get the fire burning a little bit. I take, I take some bear grass plumes, which don't burn very well, lace mm -hmm. them with toilet paper, get them burning like a torch, walk off to the side of the hill and say, hey, grizzly bear, why don't you back off a little bit or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the bear does. But then 20 minutes later, he's on another side of the mountain. Here he comes again. Crunch, 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 crunch. I get more bear grass burning, go off. Mm -hmm. He does this till 2 in the morning. At 2 in the morning, he finally leaves me alone, and I go to sleep. You were able to sleep? I was so tired. <laughs> no, the uh, brown part goes down. How's that? Perfect. Let's put the rain fly on. Oh, it rains any harder. The Grizzly Hilton rises again. Yes, sir. Well, I just hope that bear realizes it's, uh, it's your personal fight, you know? It no one else is involved. nothing to do with you. Just, uh, I keep having this image of a big, uh, a big claw coming through the roof, you know, I just can't sleep. I mean, if you're in a tent and you hear, you know, you hear the bear, you probably hear the bear from pretty far away walking, don't you? On a calm night, they make a lot of noise, yeah. Can you hear them breathing? Only, well, yeah, but only when they get 10, 15 feet away. Oh, God.
I think I know this bear. His name in 1976 was Happy Bear, and he was a four-year-old. And he would play by himself for hours at a time. That grizzly bear is biting the ice. He's smashing the ice with his paws now. There's bear scat all over that snow field. Huge bear scat. Fresh. Yeah. And there's a little bear that pranced around it. That's what he's prancing around. It was the biggest bear scat I'd ever seen. It had to be a huge grizzly. Have you ever been down there before? No, I don't go. I don't know. That's bears. I leave it alone. I don't go down there. It's the first time. It's lovely down there, but it just doesn't belong to us. Do you think you'll ever come back here again? No. Uh. Because you 
because you went down there? Partly. Partly because I haven't been doing a great job. My operation isn't as clean as it used to be. And I gotta stop this stuff. So you bring too many people. Yeah, I haven't been great here the last few years. I've been trading off. I've been trying to publicize bears, and I've been coming here more than I should have. And it's a real delicate balance. There's no way to know when you're really treading too heavily. My feeling is maybe I've treaded too heavily, and it's time for me to back off. It's time to say farewell to these bears for a good while. This, this is it. I miss this place, though, because it's a special place. Someone that you knew well was, was hurt by a bear. Would it change your feelings at all about grizzlies? No. Well, suppose it was someone who um, knew what they were doing, who did everything right, who hung up their food, who, who know, really knows how to camp, and despite all their precautions, just by some freak. Well, I think that person would also be aware of the fact that once you go into grizzly country, you are automatically entering a system where man is not the dominant animal. Mm -hmm. And in the configuration of, of things that are really possible out there is the possibility that a grizzly bear can tear up your camp for no fault of your own or mm -hmm. tear you up. It's, mm -hmm. it's an element of risk and it's an element of, that I've struggled very hard to try to protect in wild places because we don't need our wild places all safe and tame. We need right. a few untamed last vestiges that we can go into and enter the conditions uh, with which the, our first white ancestors hit this continent with four and five hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. I think it's something which by its very definition is, is, uh, is uncontrollable. I think it's unmanageable. I think it's, I think it's uh, uncompromisable wilderness. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing we can do. If we want to have that great bear out there, I think we have to accept him just as he is, with all his cantankerousness, with that indomitable quality about him. And we can't have the bear on our terms. He's not going to be non-aggressive. He's not going to be shy. He's going to be exactly what he is, which is mm -hmm. a risky proposition. Well, and last night? Here's the end of our ordered year, our ordered life. It's not Laurel's wine. It's not Laurel's wine, but it's a nice little wine. Want to go to Arizona? Mm, yeah, okay. Get down where it's warm. Mm-hmm. See all the friends we didn't get to see last winter? Mm. Last nights are always sad. I oh, know. It is sad. A lot of last nights. Sorry. I always get bummed out the last day of my lookout. I miss this place already. Hey, Stu. Ready to go down? Sure. I didn't know if you were coming today. I just tried to hook up my radio. Couldn't get it to work. I said, my God, you know. I'm only two weeks late. Figured we better get you out before you get snowed in. Yeah, you bet. We got a real hot spot to gear. I just figured we'll just load up until you're full and go on down. Okay, well, this one ought to be about the same weight. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping. So that's a heavy son of a bitch. Hi, Stu. Did you pack oh, Leonard out then? Yeah, I took him out last week. Has Leonard seen many grizzlies up there this year? Not too many, but he wasn't disappointed. No, I know, I know that. <laughs> that's not his favorite thing in the world. Uh, <laughs> He said after the helicopter was up there, he didn't see much. Hey, that's true of um, me, too. I was up there the same day the helicopter was. Oh. Boy, they just disappeared in a hurry. That's something I'm going to call a park on this year. Is they got no business doing surveys by helicopter. That just drives the bears just crazy. Of 
course, I've been doing these seasonal jobs so bloody long, it's been... Uh, it'd be hard to work year round, wouldn't it? God, it'd be awful. It's been eight years since I've worked more than six months out of a whole year. I'm right down to the point now where I consider four excessive. <laughs> now, you told me last year you said you might have to get a real job. Yeah, well, that's true. I got to a little girl to support, you know? Baby needs new shoes and all that. I'm going to probably wrap it up with bears this year, I think. Are you? Yeah, and I'm trying to, what I'm doing is working on a book. Oh, good. And if I can get advance on the book, I can, I can live through the winter and spend the winter writing. Yeah. So I think I'll go down to Arizona. Sit down in front of a typewriter and bang away. I knew it was coming sooner or later. Oh, it sounds pretty good, man. done a lot of damage. It's eating the carpet, it's broken the picture. Oh, damn it. It'll be taken care of today. Look at this. He's wearing an the picture. Oh, He's man. Broken. Wood rats. There's so much trouble when they're looking for a place to live for the winter. And they're so big, you're afraid to go to sleep at night because you know one's going to run across your face. Tundra bear mauled much. Will you get a screw for this someday? Yeah, I will someday, hon. Sorry, wood rat. You need a new home. What do you think varmint's like? Cheerios or bran? Cannot touch his elbows. Hi, 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 Oh, we can tuck fingers together, huh? You gotta, you know, get one of our own sticks from the yard. Oh. Yeah, I guess we've done work since you were here last. Oh time. yes, we've got yeah. lots of friends to pound nails again, uh huh? Uh huh. We've got all the big mines at Chadwick's place and uh, pound nails. I want to see how clean our windows are. <laughs> Rainbow peak. Beautiful. Not too bright, but split heavy log. Yeah. Ruler not too much, but strong. It's going to be the most efficient way to do this. You work and I supervise? Sure. I love to do this. I'm no good at it. I have no finesse. Yeah, but you can't go too far wrong either. <laughs> We had to go out and visit Mom and Dad in Portland. We had no money. And one old friend of my mother's was there, and she said, well, Lisa, it's nice to see you, and where do you live now? And I said, well, in the winter, we live in around Tucson, or as close as to the Mexican border as we get, and in the summer, we go up to Montana, and, you know, live with the grizzly bears. And she was saying, just in her mouth, it was like, 
Oh, well, however do you manage two homes? And I was, my mouth was just open, ready to say, oh, well, I trust the help implicitly. You know, they, they never steal the sterling. And then, but she was, before I could even get the words out, she was like, oh, you know, you live in a tent, right? Ever since I started filming, I've had a, a certain sense of, of a last autumn for the bears. I feel that every time I run that movie camera, what I'm getting is a historical record. It's essentially, it's a, it's a document that's set in the past. And I know that I'm wrapping up something here, too, after eight years of filming, and I'm done with something, but also I'm leaving something behind which will never be there again. And I see Teal and little Laurel playing together, and I realize that our two daughters will probably have a chance to grow up on the fringe of, of what's left of the wild country south of Canada. And, and this is really a question more than anything else, because I, I, I have a feeling that maybe they're going to be about the last of their generation to see that. That's yeah. a sad comment. Yeah. All right, well, what's... I mean, how can, you, how can you go after it day after day and think that's the end? I mean, don't you have some, uh, some hope down in there? Yeah, really I've got strong, some hope. Really strong, really strong. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, I feel that our odds of making it are precisely the same as uh, our ability to give a little bit of grace to those last few bears out there and uh, the, the, leave the country big enough, just big enough to support maybe one last grizz. I feel yeah. that indeed that our, our odds are precisely the same. And I feel that that's, it, that's worth fighting for. That's worth everything. I mean, yeah, what else are we going to do? All we've got left south of Canada, what the American Indian coexisted with for at least 10,000 years, a habitat, is a couple of isolated enclaves that still contain the big megafauna, such as my bears and the other big carnivores. And all the rest we've transformed into human and economic landscapes. And I think this is a uh, pretty risky proposition because we all sprang from that habitat. And quite simply, that which evolves doesn't persist unless the same forces that created it also continue. To me, as these forces uh, include these large animals whose future existence on Earth is totally dependent upon us now. If I didn't have a place to go that felt as wild as country has to be to support a grizzly, I'd go nuts. I wouldn't, I can't imagine living in this world without knowing that place is there somewhere, even if you don't get to it. Yeah. Figure when we're 74, one last epic journey into grizz country. Yeah. If that's the only trip one ever takes and it's only in one's mind, it's still good enough. Look at him. Hi, grizzly bear. Look at that grizzly bear, he's got frog-like legs. What a magnificent critter. Thank you, bear.